Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back to another episode of Celebrating Act Two. Today we once again have one of our favorite guests, John Mariani, the virtual gourmet, and uh, my partner, John Coleman. Hey, John, good to see you again. Gentlemen. Hey, uh, John, I was reading your newsletter, The Virtual Gourmet, this week, and uh, loved the, your article about the 10 wine myths that could cost you money or, uh, let's see, do I remember the title? Uh, no, but, but they could cost you money or... Time. Yeah, it, time. anyway, I love them. We don't have time for all 10. Could you give us your top three out of those 10? Sure. Um, these are, these are, mid, well, I'll t do the ones, the top three that people generally do kind of scratch their heads about and know about. That is that red wines get better with age. Well, a lot of people, all wines get better with age. No, first of all, just to get out, get white wines out of the way. 99% of all the white wines made in the world should be drunk as soon as they are released or within a year or two. Only a minuscule number great Sauternes, some of the great uh, white burgundies will uh, get better after four or five, six years. Okay, so let's just dismiss that. Drink the white wines as soon as you get them. As for red wines, uh, I would say that 75% of red wines that are produced do not require aging because they are made to be drunk upon release. You know, these wines have already spent, in many cases, uh, they've been aged in stainless steel, They've been aged in oak barrels, and they've been aged in the bottle. So they might have spent a year in, or two in 18 months in a, a, an oak barrel, and then they put it into a bottle, and they're sitting there for another year or so. So the producer is saying, okay, now this is going to taste like a good wine that I wanted to make. And that's how you should drink them. You go, to the, you go to the wine store, my wife and I are having steak tonight, <clears throat> what should I get? Well, the guy's not going to give you wine that you can't open for four or five years. He's going to give you, well, this is a very nice Cabernet from California, you'll probably enjoy this. Drink it that night, okay? Even if it's a, let's say, it's now 2020, let's say a 2016, 2017, 18, okay? You're not going to get a 2019 Cabernet Sauvignon because that means it was just made last fall. It hasn't even been put in the bottle, Okay. Now, what about those wines that do need or seem to need aging? Only the very finest red wines in the world can take considerable age and get better. And many will get better if the experts who know those particular wines or the winemaker says, if you can afford to do so, first of all, you can afford to buy this wine then it's going to cost you a lot of money. And I do think it'll come into better balance and be more mature in three to five years. Okay? So you could take his advice, or even the guy in the wine store, but you're not drinking that with a steak tonight. Okay? It's still a risky business. And people who think that the older the wine, the better it's going to get, is because they think there's something going on in the wine. There's some living thing inside the wine that is making it better and growing. No, there's nothing living. If there's something living in your wine, you've got to bad bacteria in there so for instance uh the other night i was feeling crazy with my family and you know eat drink mary who's gonna die tomorrow <clears throat> i had down the cellar a 1970 bottle of cheval blanc cheval blanc is one of the greatest of all bordeaux and known for its longevity and i've had some older ones so i took the cork out of the bottle my family's there with me pour it into the glass, swirl it. Oh, oh, brother, right over my shoulder. It was shot, matterized, oxidized, undrinkable. And my wife said, well, you know, let's get some air in it. After got some air in it, it was even worse. So 1970 bottle of Cheval Blanc. Um, the, the, so the key is drink stuff you're going to buy today, tonight, or next week, or next year. Uh, unless you are a real connoisseur and can afford... The, um, um, of red wines of real noble character. You're just uh, wasting your money. The wine's probably not going to not going to get any better. It may even get worse. 
You know, you bring up an interesting point, uh, John. Uh, I know. Uh, on the on the uh, aging of, <laughs> and and your humility is just beyond any. <laughs> but um, the the aging that was only fifty years uh, old. You should, probably should yeah. have let it age for another twenty years. I would think. <laughs> but some, some, some wines go through what they call a dumb period. This could be a fairly young wine. In other words, let's say you bought a <clears throat> a 2010 wine, okay? And it's known to be a wine that takes some years to develop. Um, on first tasting, the connoisseur will say, ah, this is really good, but I do think it's going to knit together better. So you taste it in 2013, and all of a sudden, there's nothing wrong with the wine in terms of oxidation. It's not bad, it says, but this, they call it going through a dumb period. It has lost something in the mechanics and the texture and the in the uh, makeup of the wine, the the grape juice, the fermented grape juice in there is going through an adolescent period, just like adolescents. They kind of nasty and really, you know, you know, don't, don't want to deal with it. Um, give it another two or three years, and that wine will have passed its dumb period within within the bottle. So, in other words, it's already yeah. been bottled, and it's getting better. And just as um, continuing on that myth, what is the generally the oldest wines that really taste good in 50 or 60 years. Are there such wines? They would be the top of the line Bordeaux, like that like that uh, uh, Cheval Blanc that I had. Um, but there's no guarantee at that year. I have had some <clears throat> wines that go back 80, 90 years and were remarkable that they were drinkable at all. And even a couple that were pretty darn good uh, I remember tasting a 1929 Mouton Rothschild, which was considered one of the great years, the pre-war years. And um, I tasted it and I said, wow, this thing is still alive. Fifteen minutes later, it was brown and undrinkable. Because uh, what happens is the, the oxygen from the air just rushes in, and the, oxi uh, the oxygen in the air just oxidizes the wine, because it's a very fragile creature. So... So give us another myth that will save us money and save us time. Okay. And, and embarrassment. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, sp tasting and spitting. Oh. Now, professional sommeliers do this all the time. They taste, they spit. They taste, they spit. They swirl it around in their mouth several times. They go like this. Oh, it's disgusting. Go, <laughs> what this? And they spit it out. Now, if you are a professional sommelier, they do this because they are basically looking for defects. Um, and they're trying to get some air. I swirl it around the mouth. They're trying to get some air uh, in there. Um, but the fact of the matter is that uh, the average person, you just take it, smell it. Oh, this smells good. Take a sip. Maybe go like that. Swallow and say, oh, this is really, really delicious. So you don't have to go through all of that. And the whole spitting thing is just wasting wine. But well, remember, uh, sommeliers go through 50, 60 wines a night. So they cannot take a swig of, of everything. But at home, it's just a disgusting thing to do. <laughs> I'll, I'll agree with that. Yeah. So that's number two. We have time for one more. Uh, one should always sniff the cork. This is a great one. Okay. A cork put into a wine, we could talk about corks versus cork uh, uh, screw caps uh, another time. I'm all in favor of screw caps. <clears throat> corks are put into wines for a very, very tight seal. And when you pull it out, they say if you sniff the cork and it smells funny and musty or not quite right, ugh, the wine is going to be terrible. That's not necessarily true. A cork is not the wine itself. Now, there are elements of the wine, flavors in the wine, chemicals in the wine, that will get up into the cork, because if it's been on its side, the cork's going to get some of the liquid of the wine there, certainly. And it, better is if you pull the cork out and the cork is cracked, stuff is cracked off it, not because you did a bad job of pulling it out, but the, the cork is really old and rotted. Um, <clears throat> that's a better indication that you may have <clears throat> excuse me, trouble ahead. But the best thing to do, as with tasting before, pull the cork out, take a look at it, and say, well, that's a nice cork. <laughs> you know, if it looks healthy, <laughs> just put it aside. And then the same thing. Pour the wine, swirl it, sniff it. Uh, it doesn't tell. The, the, the smelling the cork is not. It really doesn't tell you anything. 
three good pieces of advice. It's so three good it's so rotten that that uh, you'll smell <laughs> it coming out of the bottle right away. Yeah, yeah. Um, good, good advice, and it will save me money. Uh, it'll certainly save me time and embarrassment. But I want to, you have you have ten uh, advice. Can you just tease us with some of the other myths that you sure. deep? Expensive wines are all, all often allocated because of scarcity, which is not true. It's because of marketing. Um, alcohol levels are whole a result of climate and terroir, which is not true. Alcohol levels can be boosted artificially. Ooh, and, um, I didn't know that. Uh, well, you'll know soon enough. Yes, and, when uh, I read the article, yeah. Uh, and uh, So there's, there's a number of others that we could uh, talk about another time, including the screw tops and why screw tops are, in fact, better for you. Yes, that's a good topic all by itself. Yeah, thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thank you. See um, you guys soon. Yeah, and now before we go, we got to remind people that they can get the rest of the seven myths mm -hmm. on your virtual gourmet newsletter mm -hmm. at johnmariani.com. And uh, they can go, if they're, they're not watching this currently, they can go find that issue in the archives. Right. And, and as a special bonus... Just for our audience today and anybody else that they tell ever, you can go to youtube.com slash Celebrating Act 2. And in addition to uh, other great single episodes uh, that uh, we have uh, done with John, you can binge watch John on his own special playlist and spend hours with a good glass of wine. And maybe in so a nice uh, meal ordered in from a local restaurant uh, where you may have acquired that bottle of wine. Um, there's a whole chapter on that. And um, enjoy yourself. But, John, these are always wonderful pleasures to uh, uh, hear your perspectives, your experience, your years of going out and learning what's really uh, most of us would hope to have a piece of, which is good food good wine, and uh, uh, enjoying life. And never spitting. <laughs> uh, Swirl, but don't spit. Yes. That's another episode. <laughs> with, with, with that, we should say goodbye. That's the best advice I can think of. Uh, right, we're probably about 20 seconds beyond goodbye. <laughs> See you next time, John. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.